I want to start with, uh, first off, being born in Boston, right? Tell me that you're a huge Boston sports fan, right? Through and through, everything? Through and through. Now, now are you from New England? Yes. So I grew up in uh, Brattleboro, Vermont, right at the bottom of the state. And we have a bunch of connections here that I've, I've looked up to see. I mean, you went to UVM. Uh, I went to UMass. You went to UMass. I'm a huge Boston wow. fan. I, I, I'm thinking to myself, this is crazy. So I want to get your take on that. Oh yeah, well I'll tell you, I uh, I miss the lobsters. I'm a lobster addict, and I can't find them. And uh, uh, no, I miss New England. And this is before you were born, but my uh, and this is before the Red Sox started winning. But uh, my father worked um, at a company on Lansdowne Street on the other side of the Green Wall for 35 years. So home runs would go over the fence and break the windows of the company he worked at. And at two in the morning, he'd have to go in and patch the windows. And, uh, and there's a picture, uh, and my dad grew up in New York. He actually went to high school with Lou Gehrig. So he was a Yankee fan. And, but in the 75 World Series, with Carlton Fisk hitting the home run, and I guess the 12th inning, uh, my father's in the front row right behind him with my brother, so uh, when, when Carlton Fisk is jumping up and down, you can see my father and my brother. And at my father's uh, funeral, I showed the picture and in his eulogy, I said, you know, my dad got up to see if it was gonna break a window because he might have to leave the game and he didn't really care because he was a Yankee fan. <laughs> That's great. That is that's a that's a major connection to that. I mean, uh, you know, I think that uh, that that's huge. I was wondering, is it the uh, the cask and flagon, the uh, the bar right behind the Green Monster that the windows, or is it something else? You no, know, he worked for a company called United Liquors. And United Liquors was a uh, a liquor distri distributing company, and I think they were recently uh, uh, bought in the last ten years by I think Martinelli is a uh, liquor company in New England and something, but. Uh, but he spent his whole career there. And uh, anyway, you know, uh, it brings back fond memories. Yeah, so um, let me ask you this though about uh, UMass. So yeah, I know you were there for a year of grad school, uh, right? And uh, I was there 95 to 99. I know you were what, 69 to 70? And it was a uh, zoology that you were studying? I didn't know you even had that. Well, well I'll tell you, here's who was there. Uh, Natalie Cole, Dr. Uh, Julius Irving, and the next year, uh, uh, what's his name? Um, who just went to jail? The uh, Af what's his name? Cosby, Bill Cosby. The oh, year right. afterwards, yeah, Bill Cosby went there. To, he got a graduate degree in education. So it was. Uh, it was. Uh, so we did you go to Amherst or Boston? I did. I went to Amherst. Yeah, UMass Amherst. You remember Puffton Village? I do. That's where I lived. Is I that where lived you? What? I lived in Puffton Village when it was when it was built. That's awesome. This is the best. Two seventy seven Puffton. Do you remember your uh, number? I have I have no idea, but I uh, I went through a uh, I, I I had a motorcycle and I would uh, and there was a highway right behind it and I would and I go on rides to Greenfield. That's right. Right up the road. We used to play golf uh, like at this place. Uh, it was like nine dollars for nine holes. I remember right up the road. Um, and it was awesome. That was uh, what's probably the most what's the best thing you remember about it at the time? I mean, how much different it was uh, from when I went there? What was that like for you? Uh, well, it, it wasn't as I mean, it was pretty huge then. Uh, but it was I guess what I remember is that, that was the year of Kent State. 1970s so you know I and I had gone to UC Berkeley as an undergraduate so I was I was immersed in all the protests and the anti-war movements and all that stuff and then Kent State happened and I'll tell you after the Kennedys got killed it just uh, I think it just broke broke my back and a lot of other people I think we went from hopeful to cynical mm -hmm. yeah no I can uh, I can understand that I I was um Hold on, I, I, can I share my screen here? Puffton oh, Village. I remember those 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 little places. God, that brings back such memories. Oh, that's it. Wow, what a flashback. That that's it. That's it right there. That's Puffton Village. <laughs> Puffton Village. Not wow. much has changed. I remember my friend. It was so funny because he goes, 
he wanted to live across the street at uh, on the Hobart Lane. I don't know if it was still Hobart Lane uh, when you were there, but they used to have all these parties, right? And like a ton of uh, parties behind all the houses when everybody would do it together. And it was only a couple dollars and you got your cup and you can drink whatever you wanted. And he's like, we would make so much money if we would just go over and live over there. I said, I'm not going to be dealing with this. And, and a lot of our friends were like, we don't know about this. And he's like, all right, fine, fine. We'll go to Puffton. We'll, we'll live in a shoe box, whatever. And <laughs> we went over there. Oh, okay. How much was your rent? Oh man. I'm, I, you know, we had four people there. So there was, um, I shared a room with my buddy upstairs and there was another room and then actually we had five people at one point. So, <laughs> I'm thinking it was like a couple hundred bucks. I mean, it wasn't even that much, you know, like per person, it ended up being like 200 or something. And one guy who had his own room, my buddy, he, he paid like 250 or something. I mean, it was, it was crazy. What about you? Well, well I was there. Uh, I, w I was married for a short time for about a year and a half. And uh, so it was just a, it, it was just a one floor thing. It was $150, the whole rent. <laughs> the whole thing. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, wow. it was certainly uh, certainly some fun times. I, I really enjoyed that. And I thought that was a cool yeah, connection we had. And, and from uh, your books, you know, that, that was the, the biggest thing I want to take out of some of the, you know, you've done such an amazing job over the years of reaching people through your talks, um, through your podcast, through online uh, speaking and the books. So I read uh, Just to Listen, and I'm really going to get into the other couple now. Um, get out of your own way and, and talking to crazy. I know you've put it, those a couple you know, years ago now, but how important was it and how long does it take to put something together like that um, and to help teach people and help them grow? I, I really, I really enjoyed reading that one. Well, to actually write a book, uh, I'm a, I'm, I, I have bloggeria. I just blog all the time. I, I go to bed with a problem in the world, and I don't know what the heck happens in my head, but I wake up in the morning, and then I write something, and, and I, I try to make sense of the, of the nonsense in the world. And, but the books probably take about six months, but I've always worked with a writer who kept me on track, who could uh, pull an anecdote, pull a uh, insight, pull steps, things like that. So it's about a six month process, but the publishing can be a year and a half. And I just got a three book deal from Harper Collins. So I'm writing three books now and be careful what you wish for. So, uh, uh, but you know, it'll keep me busy for a bit. That is awesome. How much uh, do you need to update? Like I know when it first came out, then there's like the updated version, because what about when you go through your life and you learn and you want to, you want to change something or you've come to, you know, Oh, wow, I found this out. You know, what do you do about that? Well, you can update it, but something I want to talk about with the just listen, because I spoke in Russia last October with a Nobel prize winner, a guy named Daniel Kahneman. He wrote a book called thinking fast and slow. And uh, I was excited, uh, and there's lots. There's a number of videos up uh, on YouTube. If you look up uh, Goulston, you'll find them. And what I wanted to do is introduce my latest thinking on listening, which is not in the book. I mean, I, I think Just Listen is a good book. It became the top book on listening in the world. It's 24 languages. But what I want to introduce to you and to people watching this, and and the title of my talk in Moscow was Change Everything You Know About Communication Forever. So you know, that, was, that was pretty challenging, a thousand Russians. And my latest thinking on listening, and if you can practice this, it'll change everything. What I realized is when you're with another person, like if I look at you and I can see you, you're listening to me. And when you listen to me, that means, well, I can deliver some information. You're checking the boxes, you're nodding. And if I'm somewhat engaging and you know, relatively relevant, you'll give me your mind for the interview. But it's a transactional thing. You're listening to me, I'm delivering stuff. And you know, and if you like it, you'll try it. If you don't like it, you won't. And so that's what I said to the uh, Russians. In fact, I had a prop and it's in the video. Here's a prop. This is a talking stick. This is what Indian chieftains use because nobody wants to share the stage. So when they're in council, whoever's holding the talking stick, everybody, he or she gets to talk. So in Russia, I'm up there on stage and you can see this in the video and they're looking at me like I'm crazy, which is probably partially true. 
And I go like this, I say, I use this as a listening stick. And I looked out at the audience and I said exactly what I told you. I said, if I focus on what you're listening to, you know, you'll nod, I'll give you some information, you might use it, you might not use it. And then I put on my NPR voice. And I said, but if I focus on what you're listening for, and I get what that is without you telling me, and I deliver that, you'll give me everything. And then I said, this is what you're listening for. In fact, I'm gonna do it with you. Okay. okay. We need a little drum roll. This is what Mike is listening for. But if you can do this in every conversation you're having, any presentation you're making, the audience will lean in. So I wanna see if you lean in. So this is what I, what I'm, if I focus on what you're listening for, what you're listening for is the trust of your listeners matters to you. You're listening for value that they can use immediately. You're listening for something that they can use like that and make their lives better. And you don't want to shortchange them on trusting you for value. And you're listening for something that's doable by them, that's not so convoluted that nobody can use it. You're also listening for whether I'm an expert who wrote a book but I make no sense, I'm boring, and I'm irrelevant because you're gonna to have to come back to me and say, geez, you know, with all due respect, Dr. Goldston, we can't post that. So you're listening for those things because you don't wanna shortchange your audience. Is any of that true? Absolutely, I mean, when I, when I read the book, I, I think I was, I'm reading and I'm trying to pick up and learn the techniques you're giving us for when I get involved in conversations for a significant other, work, uh, business, anything, and what do I need to do better so that it's a more effective communication and it comes across and I don't speak about, oh, well, look at me. No, I mean, the biggest thing I took out of it was have the empathy and learn and, and feel what they're feeling, like make that person feel felt. And I could see 100% how you say that because I've, now, and then I thought about this the other day. I was like, I'm going to ask Dr. Mark about this. If you ever talk to somebody, right, and you hear them go, do you even know how I feel? Do you even understand what's going through here? And I'm saying to myself, if I ever hear that, then I know I'm not doing the right thing because that's exactly what you're telling us to try to do is understand and make them feel felt. So if you don't do that and you don't empathize with them and say, I think this is what you're thinking and how do you feel about this? You just blew it right here in that liner. Yeah, and I'm gonna give you something, a, a, a magical hack for that conversation. And this is actually comes from my book, Talking to Crazy, which is not about mental illness. You know, I took a lot of heat for that because people say, we already have a big stigma. How can you write about talking to crazy? It's about how do you deal with people who drive you crazy? Right. You know, and uh, I took a, a fair amount of heat from the psychology and psychiatry profession. We have enough problems with stigma. How can you do that? I said, you didn't even read the book, but it got your attention. And if people read the book, they'll say, oh, this is about empathy. It's not about mental illness. So here is a hack, which means you don't have to think about it. You just use it. So imagine that person says to you, uh, do you even know what I'm talking about? Do you even care what I'm talking about? And in talking to crazy, there is something I, the hack is called the FUD crud, F-U-D-C-R-U-D. -E Probably don't need the crud, but it makes it more memorable. And so imagine that person saying that to you. What you do is you pause, you listen to them, you don't get defensive, you look in their eyes, and you say, you sound frustrated and I think you're holding back. They're gonna go, what? Yeah, you sound frustrated and I think you're holding back because I think you're also upset and disappointed too. So can you fill me in on you know, what I'm doing or failing to do that's frustrating, upsetting, and disappointing you? And then you get them to get it off their chest. And so you want, it's like going through the layers of an onion. See, because if you say to someone, you're angry, I'm not angry. You know, they feel like you're judging them, but everybody will talk about being frustrated. You seem frustrated. You know, people don't get defensive about that. And so as they're talking, you get them to talk more about it. And here's another thing to use. Uh, 
I was just on a call with someone who's in the, in the banking business. And I said, you come on too strong. And I said, here is a tool that you can use and you will close more deals. Uh, every, and, and I'll tell you, if you use this earnestly, it means you actually care about the other person. Right. If you never use it, it probably means you don't care about the other person. And what I told them is I said, whenever someone finishes saying something, you, you pause and say, hmm, say more about such and such. Hmm, say more about. Uh, because what this person does is they just snap in. Well, we can do this and we can do that. And I said, what happens is when you talk too fast, it causes the other person to think, you didn't even, listen, you didn't even consider what I said. And I, and I happened to like this person. I, and I said, look, you're a quick and deep study, but you don't want to come off as a slick person. And you're going to remind people of fast talkers who really took advantage of them. And they're going to react to you like a fast talker. And, uh, and the point is, you're just a quick study. So I want you to discipline yourself. But when you're in a conversation, when the other person finishes, you go, hmm, which signals that it came, it got in, and you're considering it. And then instead of coming back, you know, with your know-it-all answer, you listen for some emotion. If they use the word amazing, awful, terrific, you go, hmm, say more about the awful. And what happens is they, excellent tool. they open up more and more. Uh, but even then, if, and, and what you want to learn to do is if you do that or you use the FUD crud thing and you notice the other person, you're going to actually notice them engage with you. You're going to feel them coming towards you because you've attracted them as opposed to driven them away. There's some amazing techniques just like you're talking about right now. And then I try to apply it. Uh, to our, you know, to our life, you know, like, so I'm a, I'm a sportscaster, right? And, and when I'm reading what you're saying and hearing about what you're saying right now, too, and I've been working on this, and we always are, but similar to a broadcast, when I, when I do a game now and I'm working with an analyst, I used to just come right out, oh, this is what I got next, blah, blah, blah. And how about in the interviewing process, right? When we interview a player or a coach after the game, all we want to do is we got our next question and we're not really listening or following up on what they just said. So I think that kind of goes right to your point about what you're talking about too. Like what other, I guess, advice would you give to people such as me or people in our field about broadcasting and what you think we do well, but what we don't do well, you know? So, so here's another thing and you're going to get promoted for this one. Uh, most people in the world have this feeling that the world doesn't treat them as very important. You know, I mean, it's, 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 it's a, it's universal. Oh, the world doesn't treat me as important. And so if you can use in your interviews, if you can, if you were to say to someone, hmm, whatever they say, hmm, hmm, could you say that again? Because that was, that was too important for our listeners to miss out on. Hmm, could you say that again? Because that's too important for our listeners to miss out on. Mm -hmm means, you know, you're not being transactional. You took it in, you considered, and then you told them they were important. And then they repeated it again. Or you can say when you're broadcasting, now you might not get away, but, but if you can say, if you, if you see something, you go, and you say to someone else, you can say, hmm, did you see that? Uh, because the hmm actually demonstrates that something has gotten in and you've considered it. So you're supposed to say hmm right now. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Instead, I'm just nodding. No, I, and, and I agree with that. I mean, and that's, I, I kind of tried to think of some tools, you know, like with what you're talking about, uh, when my partner says something, I, I'm listening. Do I, do I, does it require a comment? Like, hmm, I agree. Or can I let it go? So it stands alone, you know, cause it's very important and I don't want to interrupt. Or do I have something else additional to add that's important enough and do i have time to say it those are kind of some of the things that i go through you know just in my field yeah so here, here here's a tip i, I have uh 
I now have Zoom calls, but I, you know, for over a year and a half, I've had breakfast every day with Larry King. Wow. He has a breakfast club. It's been going for 20 years. He gets him out of bed. And he still has a show on home TV. Uh, and, and, you know, and, and it's, and he's been through hell this year. I mean, he, he, mm. the stuff he's been through, the illnesses, he got divorced. He, he's had a stroke, leukemia, congestive heart failure, a tumor in his bladder, sepsis. He died, he, he, you know, they had to bring him back three times and he just keeps on going. But something that I've noticed about Larry and uh, at least in his public thing, and I actually wrote up something, I think uh, it was like the, uh, and, and I think I write about this in one of my books. What you wanna be is you don't want, you wanna be a, a pluser, not a minuser and not a topper. And a pluser means you add to what the other person's saying. So when you go, hmm, mm -hmm. say more about that. Or hmm, say that again, because it was important. You're being a pluser. And people love that because you're adding to them. A minor, sir, is when you distract. It's almost like you didn't hear what they were saying and you get onto the next thing because you just have these questions and you're not connected. And a topper is someone who tries to top what you say. Oh, I'm in New England. We went skiing in Stowe. Oh, I remember Stowe. We go to the Alps now. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I just wrote it down. I think that's huge. I mean, and, and two of the three are, are not good. <laughs> I mean, you, you, need to be, you need to be the pluser. And we all have to work on that. We all have to work on that. I mean, I, uh, uh, here's, an, here's another tip because I, I have a friend named Marty Nemko. He is, uh, is an NPR show out of San Francisco. He's this great career coach. And when Just Listen came out, and we were having a conversation, he said, you know, Mark, the guy who wrote a book on listening, you really suck. <laughs> and he gave me something called the traffic light rule. In fact, I even have a picture of a traffic light behind me. I should put that up here. And what he said is, you know, okay, when you're being interviewed or you're doing a presentation, you know, people are there to listen to you. But if you're in conversation with another person, you've got 20 seconds before the green light turns to yellow and another 20 seconds before the yellow light turns to red. And if you go 40 seconds and you're still talking, you've worn out your welcome. And the challenge is those 40 seconds feel so good because you're getting stuff off your chest. It's like a high colonic of oh, this is great. And you don't even notice that the other person, you know, is, is looking at their watch. They're looking over your shoulder because something that feels so good to you, how can it be something that's frustrating the other person? And, and, uh, and I think it's a great rule to use that when you're in a regular conversation, and I'll tell you who it's really pertinent to, there's a lot of people in technology who are a little bit on the spectrum. And I don't mean that in a negative way, you know, they're just, they're just you know, kind of a little bit on the spectrum. And sometimes when they get speaking, they love what they're talking about. And they don't pick up on the cues or clues that, you know, you've tuned them out. And, um, and so I've actually coached tech executives who are really techies. I'd say, you know, you got to discipline yourself with the hmm uh, tactic or the traffic light rule. Because you don't, you see, you don't tune into other people and you don't get that you've overstayed your welcome. So only 40 seconds per se on a, on a topic, if you will? Like what happens when you're doing your speech and you're, you're up there for 30 or 45 you know, minutes? If you're giving a speech, you're, you know, you're giving the, uh, uh, they expect you to talk. Okay. You know, but, you know, uh, but the key is uh, be engaging. So part of what I do with audiences is I try to, I try to talk with audiences. And you can feel a different energy when someone's talking over you, at you. When someone's talking to to you, that's business as usual. But when someone is talking with you, you lean into it because most people feel nobody talks with me. Give me an example there of when you're on stage and you're talking to the audience. How did you? How do you engage them even a little bit more? Well, when I did that thing about the listening stick, 
And when I said, if I focus on what you're listening for, um, you'll give me everything and let me see if I got it right. Mm -hmm. uh, did, I, did I already mention the three things that I did with them? Yeah, exactly. Now I know what you're talking about now. Yeah, so you kind of ask it back to them, like, hey, this is what you're looking for. Yeah, right. And, and the point is, if you get, and here's the key to knowing that you've talked with someone. When the other person is thinking, you get me, you get my situation, and you get where I'm trying to get to without my telling you. Mm -hmm. Kind of like what I said to you when I used you as an example, you know, is what you're listening for is as you're trying to grow this, you really want to give value, you know, because you want people to say, you, you really need to check out this, you know, this podcast or this interview. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, and that, it just adds to it. I mean, that's what, you know, I'm, I'm very intrigued, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to learn and see like a different percep uh, perspective, you know, because I think sometimes we go through everything and we say, oh, this is the way I do it and whatever. And then you finally realize somebody else looks at it a different way or it might not be the best way, you know, to do it. Um, I guess what, what allows you to kind of see the world this way? You know, when did this take shape for you to like recognize this is something I can do to help people and get them aware of what they're doing and why it's not working. Well, I'll give you a backstory. You know, I was a psychiatrist for many years. I was a, a boots on the ground suicide prevention specialist. And um, just two quick stories. Um, I remember uh, <clears throat> shortly after my training, I was paged to, uh, uh, to go up to uh, the oncology floor and okay an order for, uh, they put a patient to restraints uh, and for a major tranquilizer because he was pulling out his IVs, pulling out his respirator tube and all that. And I went in there and his eyes were like saucers. And he's all tied down. He has the, he has the ventilator in his throat. I said, what is it? He's going, ah. I said, what is it? And the other doctor said, he's psychotic. You know, that's why we had to put his arms and legs down. Will you uh, just write the order? And I looked at him and he's going, ah, and I gave him a pen, but his hands are all strapped down and he just scribbled something I couldn't make up. And I said, we had to put your hands and legs down because you were pulling at your IVs and you're pulling at the respirator. And I had to give you something to help you sleep. But when you calm down, we'll take you off everything. And his eyes were big like this. And so I leave and I just thought, well, the other doctors are right. And then two days later, he's off the uh, ventilator. And the other doctor saying, you know, Mr. Jones is up, he's off the ventilator and he told us to page you. So I go into the room, he's seated up, uh, seated in bed, uh, no ventilator. And he looks at me and he, and, he, and he seats me with his eyes. He says, take a chair. And then he kept looking at me and he said, what I was trying to tell you is that a piece of the respirator had broken off and was stuck in my throat. So you do know that I will kill myself. If I have to go through that again. Do you understand me? And he just penetrated. And so because of that, I learned how to listen into people's eyes. And when you can let go of trying to fit them into what you're selling or trying to fit them into, you know, what you think the problem is, people are always screaming at you to be heard. That, that, is that a story that, and how powerful that is that resonates, that sticks with you, that allows you to kind of have a tool when you do go into just even a regular conversation, you think back to something like that and how powerful that was to go. Oh, yeah. do well, that. Well, well, the, well, the big story, and I think we have a little time left. Um, yeah. You know, so I was the suicide specialist. One of my early mentors was one of the pioneers of the field. His name was Dr. Ed Schneidman, S-H-N-E-I-D-M-A-N. And he, he was the founder of the American Association of Suicidology. So he would go up to the inpatient units and they'd say, we need to discharge this patient. And none of the residents want to see them because they're still suicidal. They're not acutely suicidal, but we can't keep them forever. And we need a doctor to see them in the community. So Ed would go up, see the patient, and then call me and, or page me, and he'd say, I'm with this handsome young man. 
I'm with this lovely young woman. They're in a lot of pain, Mark. You could help them see them. And then they get discharged. And there was one woman that I'll call Nancy that I was seeing, I don't know, six months. She'd made three or four attempts before I started seeing her. She'd been in the hospital two to three months every year for several years. And I didn't think I was helping her at all. Uh, but you know, that was as long as she'd gone without trying to kill herself. And she'd come in, when she'd come in, if you're me, this is her. She wasn't catatonic, but she was like, and so there was one Monday I came in after I'd been up 36 hours because I was moonlighting at a psychiatric uh, state hospital to, on the weekend covering for other psychiatrists. And I get in the room and she's like this. And suddenly as I'm looking at the room, the color turns into black and white. I'm looking at the room, it's black and white. And then I get these chills. And I thought I'm having a stroke or a seizure. So she was looking at me and I'm a medical doctor. So I did a neurologic exam on myself. I'm going like this and like this and like this and like this and like this. And I said to myself, I'm all here. I'm not having a stroke or seizure. And then I had this crazy idea that I was looking at the world through her eyes, feeling what the world felt like. So what I said to her is, <coughs> excuse me. What I said to her is, Nancy, I didn't know it was so bad and I can't help you kill yourself. But if you do, I will still think well of you. I'll miss you. And maybe I'll understand why you had to get out of the pain. And I thought, I think I just gave her permission. I think I just made a big mistake. And that was the first time she looked at me. I mean, she looked right through me. And I thought she was gonna say, thank you. Thank you for understanding, I'm overdue. I said, what are you thinking? And she looked at me and she said, if you can really understand why I might have to kill myself to get out of the pain, maybe I won't need to. I, re I remember reading that in your book. You, you, you had that story in there. I mean, I don't think it, it's just, it's crazy because I don't think people will ever come across, you know, such, I mean, for you and your field to, to have those kind of moments uh, to just really, first saving people's lives and then you know to be able to pass this information on to many of us who are just trying to communicate better you know what i mean it's like I, i'm admiring how many different of these kind of stories that you have and and what you've done see but you can use this you know i know you and i are passionate about suicide prevention mm -hmm. there's something that i've come up with and actually people are now using it when they do remote check-in calls because when you're you know when you're sheltered at home and you're doing zoom calls there's a lot of zoom fatigue <laughs> exhausting and the zoom chats are filled with links and this article and all this chatter and it's exhausting so there's something i've written an article and people can go to markgoulston.com and find all this stuff that i push out there and i came up with something called the 10 word remote check-in and this is what i used to use with suicidal patients you can use it with your teenagers you can use it with a spouse uh, who doesn't want to talk uh, and here's an insight from a friend of mine whose son unfortunately killed himself and he said you know what i've learned is when you talk to your teenager and you say how are you doing and they say i'm great they're usually good but when you say how are you doing and they say i'm fine they're not mm. what they're saying is leave me alone and so here's how you use the 10 words and, and, and in the check-in call, if you're running a business, what you say is, I don't want anyone to feel alone going through this. So what I'd like each of you to do is think of the worst it's been for you in the last week. And it's changing now because things are opening up. But when people really shut down, uh, the leader would say, Here, we're going to do a different check-in. Think of the worst moment you had in the last week. And next to your name, I want you to write the word that matches it. And here are the 10 words. I don't know if I can get them all right. Anxious, depressed, frustrated, angry, ashamed, alone, lonely, exhausted, numb. There's another one. But the idea is you list those, and I'm telling you, Mike, Imagine this, you look in the chat room and you see people's names, Jim, numb, Nancy, afraid, uh, Jack, alone. 
Uh, and what happens is if you see the chat room populate with names and feelings, everybody, everybody sort of leans into it like, my God, we're all going through this together. And you actually admire each other like, God, we're good people and look what we're all going through together. So it creates this amazing emotional connection. And then what some organizations are doing is they print up the chat room and they say, people who pick the same word, check them with each other once a week. Because if at your worst you get numb, you're different than someone who at their worst gets angry. Couldn't agree with you more. And it's all about, right, making, like you said, making people feel felt and understanding that they're not in it alone. And I've said this before on, on other stuff that I've done is that everybody is dealing with something, you know what I mean? And you think it's all, hey, Facebook, we're all here, we're in the Bahamas, that's great. No, it's not, you know? And so um, that's the most grave of situations, you know, the, in the suicide. But we, want, we don't want to get to that point, obviously. But I think if we can, you know, get people to understand that we're not in it alone, uh, things will come out and things can get better. And, and, and so, uh, Mark, is there any things, things that you're working on now where you'd like to tell people that, hey, these are some great tools or tips uh, from what you've done, posts, uh, your podcast, anything like that? Like what's happening right now that you think's most important for people to kind of check out and, and learn from? I think if they uh, do a search for Mark Goulston and uh, suicide prevention, they'll find things. Uh, 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 I'm, I co-created and moderated a documentary, and you can get it for free. It's called Stay Alive, an Intimate Conversation About Suicide Prevention. And in it, I interviewed Kevin Hines. He's the fellow who jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge and survived, and also a Japanese pop singer who's a suicide prevention advocate. So that's free. If you go to stayalivevideo.com, you can find that. And then also, I think I sent you a, a, a link to the piece that uh, Jason Reed did about uh, where he talked to a group of men. It was interesting what he said in, in that goal cast. What he said was uh, how he blew it with his son. Because what he realized, he said, he said, I'm an entrepreneur. You know, I, I don't believe you should show weakness to your family. You know, you want to be strong for them. And he said, what I didn't realize is if you're a dad, especially a dad, and you don't want to show vulnerability, it can make your kid who is feeling vulnerable to feel kind of like they're a loser, that they're weak. And what happens is it can trigger in them feelings of shame, that there's something bad about them. Uh, and that's not your intention. Right. You know, if, you're, if, if you're a dad, you don't want to make your kids feel ashamed or feeling badly. Uh, and, and so it was really interesting if, you, if people can check that link and you can find it at YouTube, if you look up, uh, let's see, teen, teenage mental health during quarantine, mm -hmm. and you'll see a symbol of it, you know, so people can find it if they search that. And, uh, and even then, you know, I, I, I think, you know, one of the challenges that a, that a lot of us, we want to stay away from feelings because they're messy. It feels like uh, the, a person will drag us into their anxiety or depression and then we'll both drown. And yet, the more that you can help them feel less alone, feel felt, they'll start to cry with relief. And you got to make sure that when you see their tears, you're not making them feel worse. You're giving them relief. And when they feel relief, they calm down and you can actually have a conversation where you can discuss options. I hope people uh, watch and learn and, and read the stuff that you put out because it, it's, it's so important and it makes so much sense that, you know, you're right. People do not look at it that way. They look at it the exact opposite. I can't show weakness. No, I'm okay. I don't want him to think I'm weak. When in fact, it, it's, it's better if you did bring it up so that they feel, they, they feel, Oh man, okay. I'm, I'm struggling with something too. Or, oh, this guy isn't Superman. I don't have to live up to be Superman. Like, you know what I mean? You almost look at it the opposite way. That's why I've said when you read this stuff and you understand and the perception that you get is like so enlightening because you're like, oh my God, that's not the, the thing I wanted to portray at all, you know, which is exactly what you just said. So hopefully more people will come out and say, hey, I'm not perfect or I have this I'm dealing with. And then it does what you just said. It makes other people feel felt and together as opposed to 
alone and trying to live up to something. Yeah, here's something you can do if you tend to run away from feelings and you're problem solving. You give solutions and advice that the other person doesn't want. Right. And often the other person will say, I just want you to listen. And a lot of times people who are problem solvers, why I'm listening and here's a solution. No, no, I don't want a solution. So one of the things that you can do with people in your life is when they start to talk, you say, let me stop you for a second. Is this an awareness conversation or an advice conversation? And they're going to say, what? You could say, oh, if it's an awareness one, it'll take the pressure off me to come up with advice or a solution. And I won't feel the pressure to help you by giving you advice you don't want. It, probably, it just means you want to get something off your chest. And I can relax my anxiety because you don't want advice or a solution. And, and then you just ask them questions like, how long have you been feeling this way? Yep. How bad does it get for you? When it gets bad like that, you know, how do you deal with it? Like, what do you need from me right now? You know, I mean, I've had this actually before, uh, to be honest with you, whether it's a friend um, or my, you know, significant other wife, you know, at the time, like, hey, what do you need from me right now? And it's like, I just want to talk about blah, blah, blah. And then it's like, perfect. Like you have the answer and you don't blow it. Um, in the past, like you said, you go off and you do that and you try to come up with an answer and make them feel better about it. Like, I almost think sometimes you don't, appreciate or understand or know your audience like i know that my friend or whoever i'm talking to is very intelligent they've probably already went through all these problem solving steps at work school whatever it is and here i come in guns a blazing about well did you try this did you do that like they already have <laughs> they just want to talk well, about it you know so you got to know that so here's a way to stop most people in their tracks Unless someone is asking for advice or a solution, they don't want it. No, really, really, unless they're asking for it, unless they sort of say, what do you think I should do? Or what would you do? They, you know, until proven otherwise, they want to talk it out so they can get it off their chest so they can calm down. But you gotta, you got to help them get it off their chest. Whereas if you thwart them, if they're trying to get something off their chest so that they can calm down and then have a, a reasonable conversation, if you jam them with advice and solutions that they don't want, that actually make them more frustrated, uh, you know, then it's, 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 I wouldn't say it's harmful, but it's not helpful. Perfect tool. Absolutely. What you just said, if they don't say, hey, what would you do? Or I need help with this. Or what can I do? So if you don't hear that, right, and you've been listening, listening, you know how sometimes they can go on for a while. Mm -hmm. At some point, would you be okay with saying, would you like my help here? Or, or can I offer a suggestion? Or do you not do that at all? Well, something I mentioned before, the important word is really incredible. And, and, and if you were to say to the other person, this is what you've said is much too important for me to miss what you were trying to get across. Mm. You know, and I could guess what it was, but I don't want to guess what was the most important thing for me to get from what you just said. And what some of those people will say is the most important thing is you listen to me. Got it. Well, true, true to form uh, with the book. Um, and I, again, I enjoyed it so much. And it was awesome to read that. And I'm, you know, going to continue to kind of do a little bit more now. And I want to check out your podcast, um, which I think was great. Uh, my wake up podcast, I'm just getting uh, going with it. But it sounds like it's some really cool um, conversations that you've had with people where there was their aha moment, right, where they, they realized something. And I know you had this too, back in the day, um, after taking time off from school and changing your career and becoming a psychiatrist. So that seems like a, a thing right up your alley. And you're probably uncovering that from uh, a ton of people, haven't you? Oh, yeah, I would say, uh, I think we're up to about 110 episodes, uh, mm -hmm. posting two a week. And uh, I would say more than 50% of the people have said, this is the most vulnerable I've ever been in public. And I always tell people, and I tell people before they agree, I say, this is going to be just a personal conversation. And what my listeners and I listen for is vulnerability, courage, wisdom, humor, lessons learned. And we don't have to post it. If it's too personal, we don't have to post it. But so far, out of 105, 103 
have said, no, I want to post it. I want people to see this human side of me. There were a couple of people who say, no, I didn't like it, you know, because they were selling something. Right. They're just selling. And I tell people, this is not about, uh, this is about having people want to find out about you and then they'll find out where to go and then they'll buy all your stuff as opposed to you selling something uh, which they may or may not buy. And, and they probably thought, like we talked about, that by being human and saying what you really feel and giving the, the story, as opposed to trying to perceive and be somebody that you're not, that you've engaged more people and they actually want to, you know, like you said, buy what you're selling. I mean, it's probably worked out better for them uh, than if they thought about doing it the other way. Absolutely. Dr. Mark, thank you so much. Um, I just, I really appreciate you even, you know, taking the time to do this and it just, uh, it means so much. And thanks for all that you're doing for people and uh, we get behind it and uh, hopefully, you know, we can end up changing people's lives and making things happen for the better. So thanks so much. Well, thank you. And look, if you, uh, you know, I really do have this passion about preventing mental illness and suicide. And, you know, if in your travels, suicides up in colleges you know and you i know you report in college uh, sports mm -hmm. and stuff like that but uh you know if there if in your doing that or if, or if you're reporting a game and you heard there was a recent suicide or you know they have a suicide problem you know I, i'd be happy to help if if you wanted to make any introductions no no doubt thank you and i will i think when i when by doing that video like um that i did i know you have the one i'm about to watch it so thank you for emailing me um i will bring you up and say hey you know because Anybody that you know could use some help or we can do something better for that person, then absolutely. Um, I'm just starting to kind of get going. We put it out like a few months ago. Um, but once the games get going again, <laughs> you know, hopefully. So thank you for that and for offering that. That's, that's awesome.